Warren Keating is a painter who has based his popular overhead series on images he's produced with a digital video camera. The result brings together the perspective of a camera with the nuanced control of light and color that can only happen on canvas. definitely a kid that drew at a very early age and then, you know, never gave it up. I had a debilitating congenital uh, thing and I couldn't walk for several years. And so I took a lot of art classes, really relied on hmm. that to get me through it. So that's when I really, you know, got to the point of no return where I'm an artist and that's just the way my life is going. I was not socially interacting with other kids. That's why I sort of antisocial today because I didn't learn a lot. <laughs> I missed some of the classes. <laughs> when you're a child artist, you have sort of an advantage because people are amazed if you can make anything that's realistic. My first solo show was in 95 and it was this sort of drippy, dirty paintings of women in bathing suits in front of smokestacks and oil platforms. It was kind of an environmental statement. It was really hard for people to buy those mm -hmm. and put them on their wall. I think these have more of a universal appeal, but at the same time it's a unique thing that no other artist kind of does. Yeah, you know, I've been trying to make a, a realistic painting that is also abstract, that's also, you know, it's not just an old-fashioned kind of pre-impressionist idea, but it, uh, you know, addresses all the stuff of the 20th century, mm -hmm. you know. Using this viewpoint, by right, foreshortening the figure and whatnot, you know, it becomes sort of an abstract shape that much easier to make it, you know, more of a modern kind of story. When I first started painting people from overhead from that first trip to Paris, I made smooth contours. It was more of a curvilinear type drawing. I mean, it's still pretty realistic overhead, yeah. but I used curvilinear lines to depict these foreshortened people. I didn't use the pixelation. I ignored that and sort mm -hmm. of filled the blanks in with my mind and created a smoother, more realistic image. And then eventually something happened. I was, you know, it was a late night, but I let, <laughs> let go. And I had a moment where, you know, things came together and I went, well, let me see what happens if I just render it what I'm seeing, you know, leave it be what it is. I could feel it once I made that painting, I went, okay, I need to pursue this. And now it's really becomes the size of the pixel to the size, I'm really getting into mm. the, you know, there's certain things where it really works and then there are other ones that don't work as well and the mark gets too small to the relationship of the canvas. It's become this real obsession. It's a rectilinear mark. It's a hard edge rectilinear mark creating a blur, you know. This is sort of a ordered, a planned chaos, you know. There's some, yeah. it all works together more than just slapping the paint on there, even as, you know, skillful as one could do it and make it look fresh. You know, you're trying to make every mark look like both nonchalant and extremely yeah. focused at the same time. You do this kind of painting. The work is not the, you know, is inconsequential. That's, that makes it easier to sell, really, in a weird way. Even though I value my work, like, I have pretty high value on my work compared to most artists that sell their work online. I mean, I tend to be on the upper scale. But at the same time, my meaning, you know, what quantifies me, what gives me quality as a person, is the process I developed in the end of my life. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. The body, you know, it's not, the individual piece is inconsequential. So that makes it easier to, to sort of which is to dissipate some of the pressure. Yeah. But at the same time, I, I understand where you're coming from. I mean, I usually do one painting a week, you know, if I'm lucky. It's more like a scientist trying to put together a formula or a cure or whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, you're just in this pursuit now. I don't want to be negative because I'm a very positive person, but you look at the finished work and you go, I just didn't quite make it. Okay. You know, some more than others, and those end up getting destroyed. But you're always just right, it's just right there, right beyond your grasp. Thankfully, though, because it's dragging you forward. It's, you know, it's the carrot that's, you know, moving you along in your aesthetic and making you evolve. And 
you know, and then also I'm a I'm a very hardcore, very simple businessman about making art and selling art. Yeah. When someone buys a painting of a blue umbrella, chances are I'm going to make another painting of a blue umbrella. And I don't have a problem with that. I love when people connect with my art. And, you know, I do motifs. I have motifs that I repeat. And, you know, if it's, the painting is not successful, it doesn't get sold. But if it is, you know, and, and it's... You know, that's the magic of making art. You can just completely ruin something and that's it. It's, yeah. it's gone. And then other times you can do the same painting that you did two years ago and it's brilliant now. Mm -hmm. Something happened. This is how in the most expressive painting um, in, in the show. Very, very uh, gestural. Yeah, the content is very impressive. And that was a huge compliment to me because I am trying to make an expressive, drippy, motion-filled mark without it being messy and ugly. Yeah. When I was sort of more naive and less developed as an artist, it was sort of messy and, I don't know, ugly. It's a hard term because it's, it's individual preference to make something ugly, but it captures the imagination. You know, because you look at the image and you start to create a story in your head about the person taking someone's imagination and you're making yeah. it go to work. You know, you're making them uh, interpret your work and uh, draw conclusions. I mean, I spent decades, sort of, I think, decades, ah, you know, having another job in the creative field and doing art in the garage or in whatever, the extra room, whatever. I always had a studio, but I didn't start making a living at it until five or six years ago. I think it's the anonymity of the internet that allowed me to put my art out there and see, you know, it was oh, less of a risk. You know, like five or six years ago, I really started using the internet and believing that this was a way to get to a uh, living, you know, not just move a few things and as a hobby. I had helped my dad sell a couple cars on it. Mm -hmm. So when I realized people would spend that kind of money on eBay, I started looking around and see what other artists were doing. Of course, it's a crazy, chaotic, wild west of good and bad art, but I did stalk a couple of people that were making some serious money, and that really showed me that was possible. Hmm. Let's talk a bit about your, your art. We're in your studio now. we got a lot of different paintings uh, that are up there. I thought that um, one of the, th well, I think one of the series that I've always liked is the series, sort of overhead series, which are based on photographs, and I think it started if, if I remember correctly, you were on vacation with your wife in Paris and you were shooting from the balcony downward as people were passing by. And it's a really interesting series, not just because it's based on, on a photograph, but not only the perspective, but sort of the graphic sensibility that you bring to what is a very common occurrence, people walking down the street yet you're able to use the lines of their bodies and the varying colors that they're in the frame to make it really visually arresting. And I think it's been one of the more popular series that you've produced. Well, thank you very much for saying that. Very nice and well put description of my work that hopefully I can borrow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always trying to depict motion. You know, I mean, I've always, there's been a certain amount of motion in every, even when I paint a landscape, I try to put some motion into mm -hmm. it. You know, I work with an expressive, kind of directional mark if you were to get technical. So the, again, the walking person, there's there's some sort of uh, anomalies and glitches that happen yeah. with the digital video that, that I can interpret and paint, you know, so you've got this sort of contrast between these diverse elements, but the dominant thing that's holding together is it's motion, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing a motion painting, you know, if it were in the 50s, they call it, you know, like a yeah. abstract expressionist kind of thing, but it's not abstract. All of the work I've, I've done, landscape, figurative, whatever, I'm always trying to, to find something in the simple, you know, and expand it and, and, and sort of bring people to appreciate a moment in time mm -hmm. that they wouldn't normally appreciate that moment, you know, in time yeah. that seems so simple and so meaningless, but is so powerful.